Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and this recorded lecture, we're going to be um, I'm going to be teaching on H.W. Bush's presidency as well as um, President Clinton's as well. And then the last part, I will get to uh, talking about some foreign policy challenges that both H.W. Uh, Bush and uh, Clinton will will face, particularly Clinton and so forth in the 1990s. So H.W. Bush had ran against uh, Reagan in the election of 1980 in the primary uh, as a Republican and uh, really was a fairly good um, opponent against him and kind of criticized Reaganomics or trickle-down economics as what he called voodoo economics and so forth. But um, Reagan wins the primary and then ends up asking his opponent, H.W. Bush, to be his vice president. Uh, and it worked out pretty well. And so with, with Reagan's popularity and so forth in the 80s as the, the great communicator, um, H.W. Bush is going to kind of ride on that popularity to uh, the White House in the election of 1988. And H.W. Uh, Bush had an impressive resume. Um, he had graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Yale, which uh, not only is he one of the top elite uh, Ivy League schools in the nation, graduating with Phi Beta Kappa as some of the highest academic honors you can receive in the country. He also was a naval avi aviator during World War II uh, as a young man. Uh, was shot down um, and then was actually rescued by uh, an American submarine, actually uh, uh, was able to rescue him. Um, he ended up coming back from World War II and, uh, uh, of course, was married to Barbara Bush. And uh, they end up kind of, he ended up kind of making himself in the oil business out in West Texas. And... He also ended up becoming the head of the CIA in the 1970s and uh, former ambassador to the UN. So, um, and Vice President Reagan. That's a pretty impressive resume for any any person ever serving the White House. Um, ended up choosing kind of a random vice president um, candidate with Dan Quayle, um, and he's going to run against Michael Dukakis, who uh, edged out Jesse Jackson in the Democratic primaries um, and so forth. So Bush carried um, 38 states winning the popular vote by 53.4% to 45.6%, uh, but Democrats retain control of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Okay, so you can see right here, didn't win as many states as probably Reagan did, but um, actually gained a greater percentage of the popular vote because you didn't have that independent candidate that ran um, in the 1980 election. But H.W. Bush, uh, speaking of independence, will encounter a challenger, um, a very formidable uh, independent challenger by the name of Ross Perot, who's going to take Republican votes from H.W. Bush and uh, give the election to uh, Bill Clinton in the election of 1992. So let's look at what um, he is going to um, have on his slate. Because uh, Democrats control Congress, um, they enacted legislation allowing workers to take leave for family and medical emergencies, a measure that Bush vetoed. Then they secured legislation enlarging the rights of workers who claim discrimination because of their race or gender. With the president's support, congressional liberals also won approval of the Americans with Disability Act. Okay, so ADA, you'll, you'll see this um, a lot in the workplace um, and so forth. A major piece of legislation that significantly enhanced the legal rights of physically disabled people in employment, public transportation, and housing. Okay. And so the Americans with Disabilities Act is a big deal. Um, and so people that have physical disabilities and so forth um, can have kind of undue discrimination in uh, public transportation, housing, or um, employment. So let me give an example. Okay. Let's say you have an accounting job and you have an individual who is in a wheelchair. Okay. As long as they have use of their, their, their arms and so forth, there's no reason why they can't work as an accountant regardless of being in a wheelchair. Okay. Now, uh, as a construction worker, that might be a little bit more of a challenge and so forth. Um, you'll notice, too, uh, particularly in houses, is that a lot of uh, light switches are lower down the wall. They're not up high um, so that people um, with disabilities can reach them and so forth. And you'll see that uh, uh, buildings will have to have certain um, disability access. You see, of course, you see handicapped parking spaces and so forth. Uh, but you'll see that uh, public transportation um, has the ability to um, pull uh, electronically or mechanically pull up a uh, person in a wheelchair onto a bus. Oftentimes you can 
call in advance um, to get a public transportation bus uh, to pick you up and so forth. Uh, and then access um, oftentimes uh, in apartments if you're disabled, um, usually if there's uh, an open uh, first floor apartment and so forth, you can get access to that. Same thing in um, hotels and, and whatnot. Okay. There's also a couple of Supreme Court rulings that come out uh, during his time in office. The first one, Webster versus Reproductive Health Services was in the first year he was in uh, office as president. The Supreme Court upheld the authority of state governments to limit the use of public funds and facilities for abortions. The following year, the justices approved a regulation that prevented uh, kind of like federally funded health clinics from discussing abortion with their clients. OK, so basically it allowed the states to limit basically federal or, or, or state tax dollars to, to pay for abortions. OK, and particularly to help fund uh, uh, clinics who, who were doing abortions. Also, um, the, the same Supreme Court kind of basically um, um, any um, any organization at the time that, that received federal uh, funds at a health clinic, they couldn't really discuss abortion with their clients and so forth. Um, anyway, but the big one is Planned Parenthood uh, of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. It's often just called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Uh, the court upheld a Pennsylvania law requiring a 24 hour waiting period prior to an abortion. So if you go to an abortion clinic, you meet with the medical staff and so forth, you had to wait 24 hours to get an abortion. And that um, Pennsylvania enacted that to try to uh, maybe during that time, so I might reconsider actually having an abortion. And so what this court case does is it still says that Roe versus Wade um, is kind of is the law of the land, that abortions are still legal. Um, but that the that state could actually have that um, law. Texas has a a law where uh, before you get an abortion, you, you have an ultrasound, um, and that that was controversial when that was done. But uh, it's something that uh, um, anyway Texas implemented. Uh, Bush is going to appoint two judges while in office: David Souter and Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas was an African American uh, Supreme Court judge. Um, he had replaced. Um, um, Thurgood Marshall, a long time um, uh, judge and so forth. But the controversy with Clarence Thomas um, was that he was accused of sexual harassment by um, an, another OU law professor by Anita Hill. Um, and so they had taught law together at OU and, and he was accused of, of, um, of sexual harassing her and so forth. Um, but anyway, the Congress still uh, approved him because of lack of evidence and so forth. All right. Also, one of the things that is going to be the uh, really the downfall of H.W. Bush getting reelected um, is a tax plan. So the reason why that is the case is H.W. Um, Bush had run on the campaign that read my lips, no new taxes. OK, well, when H.W. Bush came into office, he inherited um, incredible deficits from uh, his predecessor, Ronald Reagan. And so um, to, to kind of curb the, the, the deficit spending and so forth uh, in the 80s, Democrat controlled Congress passed the Graham Rudman Act of 1985 and basically said that it had a certain uh, time limit that eventually there's going to be automatic uh, spending cuts if uh, to balance, try to balance the budget. So what ends up happening is um, the, Col the Cold War ends in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union into different republics. OK. Um, and so there's not as much need for the defense mil colossal military budgets we had under Reagan. And so Congress decided to close down some bases that we had had, um, the country had since World War II, and some of them they felt like weren't necessary anymore and were, you know, a big drain on the deficit. So they ended up um, closing down some. Well, it reduced military spending. Well, because a lot of the economy throughout the Cold War is tied to military spending, we, the United States ended up going into a recession. Um, and also to try to balance the budget, H.W. Um, Bush is going to uh, make a tough decision, uh, but historians view it today as the right decision is even though he, he goes against his campaign promise, but he does sign the law, new taxes. Um, and so that was necessary to eventually get to a balanced budget. So uh, Clinton's presidency, by the end of his presidency, they're going to have a balanced budget, I think, two or three years. And that was really kind of one of uh, Clinton's big achievements. Really, that never would have been in place had it not been for H.W. Bush um, compromising with the Democrat-controlled Congress. So really, um, 
H.W. Bush and that Congress of the early 90s kind of should get credit for the balanced budgets of the late 90s and so forth. So um, that was kind of interesting ends up happening. Um, as unemployment mounted the, the, with this recession, the president could do little because the funding for many federal programs, including housing, public works, and social services, had been shifted to state and local governments during the Reagan administration. States were in trouble, too, with the decline in tax revenues. And to balance their budgets as required by their constitution, they laid off workers and cut social spending. And so that, that's going to be tough. And H.W. Bush is going to um, kind of get blamed for that. It's going to uh, kind of play into the hands with these higher taxes of Ross Perot stealing Republican votes from H.W. Bush and Clinton going to win the election of 1992. Now, um, I mentioned this when we talked about the Iran-Contra affair in Reagan's uh, second term. Um, but what, one of the things that happened when Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982 to uh, try to eliminate the Palestinian Liberation Organization that had been shooting rockets at it, Reagan, along with some other nations, did send in peacekeepers. Well, um, you end up having um, this, this terrorist organization that drove a truck full of explosives straight through the checkpoint gate right into a U.S. Marine's barrack. It blew up and killed about 241 American soldiers. It killed around 50 or so French soldiers as well in the barracks next to that. And uh, anyway, it's terrible. Um, Reagan regrets sending in those troops as peacekeeping forces because those uh, families lost their, um, their sons or brothers or husbands and so forth. And so he ends up pulling those troops out. Okay. Now, um, also, um, something that else happens is the, the Palestinians in this aggressive uh, move against Israel um, they're going to mount a kind of a civilian uprising in uh, both the Gaza Strip um, uh, along the West Bank. And so one of the things the United States is going to try to do is encourage Arab nations to um, recognize Israel's legitimacy, but also encourage Israel to create, uh, allow a separate Palestinian nation. Uh, Israel didn't want to do that. Uh, Arab nations didn't want Israel to be there entirely. The United States is going to try to take a, a middle road is, okay, Israel uh, needs to be recognized, but at the same time, Israel needs to allow a Palestinian state. And so you'll see that uh, uh, be a hot button issue throughout the 80s and 90s and so forth. Uh, also, you had Iran, the Iran-Iraq war, which I covered talking about the Iran-Contra affair. And so um, Reagan initially supported Iraq, who he thought was a lesser of two, two evils, which is he had the Ayatollah Khomeini's government burning American flags and they captured American hostages in the Carter years and so forth. Um, and And of course, Saddam is, was terrible. He used chemical weapons not only against the Iranians, which was outlawed by the Geneva uh, Convention, but also used chemical weapons uh, on his own people, the Kurd, Kurdish people. They're closer to the Turkish border and then the majority Shiites and so forth. The war ends in 1988. Um, and because Saddam is broke after that long eight year costly war, uh, he decides to invade an oil rich neighbor to the south to basically steal their oil and wealth. And that's when he invades Kuwait in August of 1990. Okay, And so this is where H.W. Bush, um, how really H.W. Bush is going to struggle domestically um, in the short term. But really, his foreign policy is kind of what he is most known for. And when when Clinton runs uh, for office in 1992, he's not able to really attack his foreign policy. He's going to attack him domestically. Uh, where he felt like H.W. Bush was weaker. So let's talk about why H.W. Bush had a pretty strong foreign policy. Well, as former head of the CIA and also uh, ambassador to the U.N., he really understand how, understood how nations worked. And so instead of trying to go into uh, with the first Gulf War and, and just the United States going their headstrong by themselves and, and removing Iraq out of Kuwait, he gets a 28-nation coalition. Okay. He gets a lot of Middle Eastern nations to join with the United States and some other European countries. So instead of the United States um, being the sole military provider, you got 28 nations that are going to basically put, give an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein that you need to get out of Kuwait. And so the Saudi government asked the United States for military protection, said, hey, can you come in? And Because they thought that Saddam was going to invade them to try to steal their oil and wealth, which was certainly possible. And so... Bush sends troops in there. It's called Operation Desert Shield. And then once they give Saddam Hussein the ultimatum, um, it becomes Operation Desert Storm. And so what they do is they proceed to uh, bomb the crap out of Saddam Hussein's forces. 
Um, in fact, the United States provided the most troops since uh, uh, the Saudis provided the second most troops, and um, they proceed to go in. Now, here is um, a decision that A.S.O.E. Bush is going to come to regret, but at the time it seemed like the right decision um, is that um, um, H.W., uh, they basically removed the Iraqi troops out of Kuwait. Um, in fact, when they were retreating, uh, the Iraqi forces set the oil uh, wells on fire, and a lot of American uh, firefighters actually out of Houston, they were used to fighting oil fires, um, end up uh, are the ones that put it out, which I've actually seen part of the documentary on that, and it's extremely dangerous. And it's incredible what those guys were able to do to, to put out those oil wells, um, the fires out of them out. Um, and so we had the opportunity, could we go all the way to Baghdad and take out Saddam Hussein then? Well, it looked like Saddam Hussein was potentially going to be overthrown by his own people. And so H.W. Bush thought, well, that would probably be the better course of action to be Iraqi led. Uh, it'll it'll uh, he'll be over. He'll be toppled um, and it'll be more something done within their own country. Well, uh, nobody really realized how much of a hold Saddam had on his own country and they were scared of him. Um, he's able to kind of retreat and then kind of um, consolidate his power again. Um, the UN does put weapons sanctions on the Iraqis because of chemical weapons. And later he's trying to, uh, was commonly thought he was trying to build weapons of mass destruction, which is what um, leads the United States uh, fighting the war in Iraq in 2003. Uh, but Saddam, is, Saddam did stay in power. And um, of course, in hindsight, it would have been better to take him out then. But it's a little difficult to know that when you don't have that information. This is Saddam in the height of his power. And of course, on the right is a picture after he had been captured hiding in a little hole in the ground before an American uh, serviceman uh, found him. And then the Iraqi people tried and convicted him in the 2000s and they hang him. So let's get into the presidency of Bill Clinton. Uh, Clinton runs uh, a really good, effective grassroots campaign. Um, and it was actually a really smart uh, political strategy. He basically said the same message over and over and over uh, in commercials. And it worked. OK. And so what he does is um, there was all these different ads that kept coming out that said, it's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid. And it was basically implying that H.W. Bush was too stupid to handle the United States economy. Of course, that wasn't exactly uh, Clinton and, and H.W. Bush are actually friends today. They've done a lot of philanthropy together. I don't think they would, he would claim that today. Um, but Clinton and Al Gore, um, his vice presidential candidate, are kind of this uh, the first baby boomer presidents and so forth. H.W. Bush was kind of that old World War II generation. He was very young when he had served World War II. Um, but what ends up surprisingly happening is um, a billionaire runs for um, the presidency as an independent. And Ross Perot does one of the best, uh, pulls a, a greater percentage of, of the popular vote than almost any other third party candidate. Um, he's, he's pulling votes like Henry Wallace did uh, in the in 1968 election. And so uh, because of that, the, the country was uh, kind of divided on, on in this election. And Clinton is going to win within the low 40, uh, 40 percentage of the popular vote because uh, Ross Perot takes a good number of votes from from the Republicans, but also from the Democrats. I remember when I was in elementary school for the election of 1992, they did like a mock election among the elementary age kids. Of course, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. Uh, but Ross Perot actually won at my local elementary school. Uh, and so you can see in this particular election, it, it's not an overwhelming victory uh, by Clinton. Um, and that's because you have a third party candidate that uh, takes votes from from both parties. Um, and so let's look at Clinton's uh, presidency here. Um, Clinton's first term when he first started out did not go very well uh, and so forth. But um, um, what ends up happening is really his first year in office is kind of riddled with mistakes and, and it kind of came off, at least according to historians, um, is that Clinton didn't really know what he was doing um, in, in terms of running a federal government. So for one thing is he had failed nominations of two different attorney generals. Uh, he had embarrassing patronage revelations about the White House travel office. For instance, he allowed, he and um, his wife allowed um, friends of theirs to stay at the, the White House and have different travel on, on taxpayer dimes. Um, also had an unsuccessful attempt to end a ban on homosexuals in the military, and so end up having um, the don't ask, don't tell policy. That, that's been changed in the Obama administration, but um, so like you could be homosexual in the military, just nobody's supposed to ask you your sexual orientation, you're not supposed to tell uh, if you were. Um, so 
historians kind of say he looked like an amateur in his first year, but he's going to rebound. Um, he focused on um, health care, and Clinton's goal was to provide a health uh, system of health care that would cover all Americans. With medical costs and insurance pre premiums spiraling out of control, of course, we know about that today, uh, the president designated his wife, attorney um, Hillary Clinton. That was the first time a first lady ever been put in charge of that kind of a major legislation. And so she kind of headed this task force to draft new legislation. And no first lady ever played a former role in, in this way of policymaking before. But the proposal had costs of the new system uh, falling heavily on employers who had to pay 80% of their workers' health benefits. Well, if that went into effect, employers would, would have to cut uh, and lay off employees and wouldn't be able to hire as many workers. And that would lead to economic, st economic stagnation. And so many small businesses, insurance companies campaign really, really strongly against it because small businesses would be the one that would be most hurt by it. It failed in Congress. About 15 percent of Americans were without health insurance at that time. And then Clinton appointed two pro-choice liberal ju jurists, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's still on the Supreme Court, and then Stephen Breyer also. He placed uh, women and racial minorities in cabinet positions. For instance, Janet Reno became the first um, female attorney general. Here she is on the top left. Um, then you also had Donna uh, Shalala, who headed the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and, and also in Clinton's second term, Madeline, Madeline Albright served as the Secretary of State. So here he is. He had three prominent women who um, served in his cabinet. Uh, also in 1993, Clinton signed the Family Medical Leave Act, which H.W. Bush had vetoed twice. And also the Clinton Clinic Entrance Act, which made it a federal crime to obstruct people from entering hospitals or abortion clinics, uh, particularly some protesters uh, towards abortion clinics were kind of blocking people from going in. Um, and so now, for instance, um, if you have a child as a, as a mom uh, and the, your workplace has to allow you at least six weeks of maternity leave without you losing your job. OK, my wife, um, she ended up taking 12 weeks, uh, 10 or 12 weeks uh, with both of our children and so forth when she was working. Uh, Clinton's administration also won approval of two gun control measures on handguns and assault weapons, though neither had much effect on gun sales or the murder rate. Um, it caused a lot of controversy, particularly among the NRA, because at that time, Charlton Heston, a uh, famous actor from the 50s and 60s in Hollywood, was head of the NRA and, and said this, this famous quote that uh, if they're going to take our guns, they're going to have to take it from my cold, dead fingers, so they're going to have to kill me to take my guns. Uh, Clinton also hired 100,000 new police officers to get tough on crime because crime between the, uh, you know, it's one thing that, that Reagan was pushing for was getting tougher on crime. Cr Clinton did so as well. Okay, so I've talked about the health care legislation. Now, what ends up happening um, is um, Bush, before leaving office, had signed the, the NAFTA uh, trade agreement, which uh, provides tree, free trade between Canada and Mexico and the U.S., uh, um, uh, President Trump just actually um, kind of redid a trade deal with Mexico and Canada during the last month of me making this lecture. And so uh, manufacturers who were looking for new markets and plant sites with, with cheap Mexican labor was all about NAFTA. Um, but labor unions are adamantly opposed to NAFTA. In fact, uh, Clinton got a lot of criticism um, for um, being willing to, to go forward with this. And because uh, um, Clinton kind of helped support it, and Congress did as well. In 1993, Clinton secured a five-year budget package that would reduce the federal deficit by $500 billion, which is one of uh, Clinton's great achievements while he was in office. And so by 1998, you have a balanced budget. And so uh, that, that was a big deal. And um, um, anyway, be able to pay down some of the debt uh, and so forth. The economy boomed. Uh, in the mid to late 90s. And in fact, it's really policies implemented by Congress, H.W. Bush and Clinton that, that lead to that. Um, and yeah, the economy, I'm, I can tell you, growing up in the 1990s was awesome. Um, during Clinton's two terms in office, unemployment fell from 6 to 4%, and the gross national product increased by an annual rate of 3%, which is great. The stock market more than doubled in value, and home ownership rose to an all time high, which is great. But we'll see that there's going to be a problem starting in the late 90s. Um, the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac be began to be too loose in lending. It's not that they gave loans to people who couldn't necessarily afford one. They were giving them too big of loans uh, and, and they were getting a little loose on credit lending and so forth. And that's going to be a problem when you get to the 08 uh, housing bubble burst and so forth. Now, um, 
After the first two years in office, the Republicans mount a really big comeback in the midterm elections and sweep into office by winning 52 seats in the House. Uh, and they also gained the Senate and they also won 11 governorships. And so they really uh, were successful at this because NRA backed candidates and also um, uh, the Christian Coalition backed candidates, among others, allowed them to win. And so uh, one of the the uh, kind of big figureheads of this is Newt Gingrich, who became um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And he, along with some of the other uh, Republicans, said what's what what's called the uh, contract with America. OK, he's actually a history professor. He announced um, a list of proposals that he vowed would be voted on the first 100 days of the new session. The contract included constitutional amendments to balance the budget. Obviously didn't get that passed. Term limits for members of Congress obviously did not get that passed. It also promised significant tax cuts, reductions in welfare and other entitlement programs, anti-crime initiatives and cutbacks in federal regulations. Um, so Clinton is going to get uh, credit for um, when he's battling a Republican controlled Congress. Normally it was like Nixon or Reagan who were battling Democrat controlled Congresses. Uh, Clinton's going to have to kind of, instead of being more left leaning, is going to become more center leaning. Um, to compromise with the Republican-controlled Congress. And really, one of the things that Clinton gets credit for is being able to work with, with Congress more so in his later years in office. Okay, And so um, one of the things that ends up happening um, is Congress, along with President Clinton, are able to, to significantly reduce the size of the federal budget. The Treasury had to pay interest on the national debt. The military budget had to be met, and Social Security had to be funded. Uh, when Republicans passed a government funding act in 1995 that included tax cuts to the wealthy and less money for Medicare, Clinton vetoed the legislation. But what happens is it ends up shutting down the government um, for three weeks. And during that three weeks time is when he's going to get to know Monica Lewinsky. Uh, the Republicans eventually gave Clinton an easier bill and the program for aid to families with dependent children provided annual payments, including food stamps to families earning less than about $7,700 a year. Um, still, many taxpaying Americans believe with some justification that the AFDC program perpetuated poverty by encouraging women recipients to bear children and to remain on welfare rather than seek productive employment. And so this will be a, a, a thing that will be a, a, a battleground politically. Various state legislatures, both Democrat and Republican, had already imposed work requirements and denied benefits for additional children born to women who were already on the Americans' um, uh, Families with Dependent Children Act. So um, one of the things that, that Clinton did is he also vetoed two Republican authored bills. And uh, Clinton did sign the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act. And basically what this did, it was the first time that they had reformed welfare. Um, and so this is another thing that Clinton is going to be praised for, um, is that he was able to work with the Republican controlled Congress and uh, reform welfare, which was a big deal. Okay, so make, make welfare uh, work a little less likely to get abused and so forth. And um, they basically, the adult recipients had to try to find work within two years um, and also gave states wide discretion in running their welfare program. So it gave a little more power back to the states. That's what we call federalism. Some powers up in the federal government, sums up to the states, and it returns some things back to the states. Now, election of 1996, um, Clinton is going to run against um, uh, Republican Bob Dole, who was a World War II veteran. Uh, who passed, I believe he's, I can't remember if he, I thought he passed away recently. Um, if he hasn't, then um, he is certainly one of the older World War II veterans. Uh, but anyway, Bob Dole, um, which actually has is, is got a pretty good sense of humor. He's appeared on Sorry Not Live numerous times and uh, is kind of does a pretty good job making fun of himself. Um, Ross Perot runs again in election 1996. Um, doesn't win as many um, popular votes as he had in, had, had in 1992 but also takes some votes away from the Republicans and President Clinton is going to win in 1996. You can see he doesn't quite win um, or he, he uh, wins by, I think, a little bit more of a margin than he had previously and so forth. But because uh, he had got about 47 percent of the popular vote uh, in 1992 and this this election, he got just over 49 percent. So it's a little bit higher. That's because Ross Perot did not do as well. Now, let's talk about. What leads to President Clinton being impeached? Um, he's not impeached for having an affair with Monica Lewinsky. He is impeached for obstruction of justice and perjury. OK, now what actually ended up happening is uh, President Clinton had been accused of sexual harassment 
um, actually by a couple of different women. And one of them was Paula Jones, who had worked for the Arkansas state government when Clinton was governor of Arkansas. And I was kind of well known that Clinton was a womanizer uh, well before um, he was governor of Arkansas and so forth. And um, supposedly Clinton had asked her to, to do something sexually and so forth. So Clinton is subpoenaed uh, to testify. Also, there was a couple of other women that came out as well. Uh, and had accused the president of similar uh, situations. Uh, and so Clinton was like, look, I, got, I don't have time to be dealing with this. Uh, and so it's the first time uh, in American history a sitting president has ever been forced to testify. Now, Nixon would have been forced to testify if he had been impeached. But uh, Supreme Court thought, no, you need to be able to testify. Um, and so uh, Judge Weber uh, decided that uh, Paula Jones' lawyer could interview other Clinton employees to see if they had similar uh, experiences, okay? And um, what ends up happening is President Clinton settles outside of court for about $850,000 to Paula Jones. Now, um, at during the three-week government shutdown, Clinton had, um, because he didn't really have anything to do during the government shutdown, um, he actually got uh, close to a White House intern by the name of Monica Lewinsky. And uh, they had a brief uh, affair. Now, when the attorney for Paula Jones was interviewing White House staff, uh, this is where Clinton commits obstruction of justice. He told uh, Monica Lewinsky to lie about their little uh, brief affair. And so Clinton ends up breaking off the affair with Lewinsky. And uh, Lewinsky is subpoenaed to testify. And uh, she lies on behalf of President Clinton. So that's committing obstruction of justice. Okay. Uh, and so also Clinton is also being investigated for campaign funding irregularities. Uh, and there was also a whitewater real estate deal as well. Kenneth Starr gets appointed uh, as independent counsel uh, to investigate this. OK, but what ends up happening is Monica Lewinsky confides into her friend um, Linda Tripp about their affair because she's she's devastated about the, him breaking it off and so forth. Well, Linda Tripp recorded their conversation and showed that she was actually having an affair, okay? And uh, she did turn over the tapes to Ken Starr because she wanted the president to be held accountable for his actions. And um, that's when things end up getting pretty crazy, okay? So um, uh, Lewinsky committed perjury, which is you're lying under oath, okay? And um, um, she is forced to testify that the president encouraged her to lie under oath, and that's obstruction of justice. OK, and so she does admit that she did have an affair with the president. Well, that was a lie because, because what ends up happening is uh, Ms. Lewinsky uh, presents a dress that had some DNA uh, evidence on it to show that they actually did. And so uh, President Clinton is uh, forced um, to go on national television and admit uh, to the American people that he did, in fact, have an inappropriate relationship with Ms. Lewinsky. Uh, and in fact, I've seen the interview he uh, he gives where he's getting asked these questions. And it was just downright awkward. Uh, I would not want to watch it again. Um, and so what ends up happening is um, he has to admit that he had an inappropriate relationship with Monica Winsky. Um, his wife, uh, Hillary Clinton, um, argues that it was kind of a Republican plot uh, against her husband and so forth. And what ends up happening, at least the impeachment she's talking about, the House of Representatives, which was uh, – controlled by the Republicans, they vote to uh, impeach him for obstruction of justice as well as perjury because he lied under oath originally that he was not having an affair um, with Monica Lewinsky. And so um, it is, uh, he did commit obstruction of justice by telling her to lie, but then it goes to the Senate, okay? In order for a president to be impeached and removed from office, you have to have two thirds vote of the Senate after it passes in the House. Well, there was enough Democrat votes that uh, uh, prevent that from happening. And so pretty much every Republican votes yes, and every Democrat votes no. 
and they needed about um, another, you know, seven vote or uh, a few more votes and, and so forth, about 12 more votes to uh, get Clinton imp impeached. But what ends up happening is it tarnishes his record. And here's the other sad part uh, about this whole uh, investigation is during this, um, the United States military had a chance to take out bin Laden, who had actually, with Al Qaeda, ordered the bombing of two U.S. embassies in Africa, uh, one in Eritrea, another one in Tanzania. And so um, we, the United States military passed on the opportunity because the president didn't want to cause more controversy during the impeachment problems. Well, that's going to be a major mistake because bin Laden is going to carry out the greatest act of terrorism of uh of, of really the last 200 years, at least, if, if not the worst act of terrorism ever, and certainly the worst act of terrorism to the United States. Um, he Clinton also gets barred from um, uh, practicing law for five years in the state of Arkansas. They moved to New York after he leaves the White House. Um, and Clinton is not really able to get much passed after um, the rest of his presidency. All right, so I'm going to get to the foreign policy stuff that Clinton is going to challenge that Clinton's going to face um, in the next lecture.